the sense of our trajectory, like where we place ourselves or understand ourselves to be in relation to God's will, right? I spent a lot of time as a youth, and and, and this was, again, one of the more unhelpful things maybe got inherited in, in the tradition that I was steeped in, right? Like the sense like you have to make the right decisions and, and find yourself in the right place so that you can be in God's will, right? So God's will is locational. God's will is taking the right risk in the right time. And, and it is those things some of the time. But it's way more what kind of person you are in the midst of what your circumstances are, right? Like what kind of a person are you when you think you're in the middle of God's will, but you find yourself suddenly, you know, and this is part of our story, we moved to Winnipeg and we thought we were going to encounter glory in this big risk. And we encountered a year of abject poverty. It was like, oh, this sucks. This does not feel like God's will. But there was something that was being done. Mm. Who, who were we in that space? Mm. You know, Philip, it just has become a really important question. Welcome to the Ferment Podcast, conversations about worship and transformation. This is our mid-season premiere. Today's guest is Chris McQueen, National Catalyst of Vineyard Creative and Initiative of Vineyard Canada. All right, what up, everybody? Adam here with the Ferment Podcast. And today, my guest is Chris McQueen from Canada. What up, Chris? Hey, man. How are you? I am good. You are the first guest back from our mid-season break. So we're coming in hot with some Canadian energy. There you go. Yeah. So, uh, Chris, maybe just to begin this, uh, you and I met maybe five or six years ago at maybe a worship retreat in the Northeast. But could you just let other folks on here know a little bit about you and sort of the way that you're positioned in serving in the Canadian context? I think that might be helpful before we launch off into all sorts of other topics. Yeah, for sure. So so I guess first first off, I'm I'm a pastor of a vineyard community here in Canada, in Ontario, at the Guelph Vineyard. And so I've kind of been in that role, bringing some sort of senior leadership there for the last two and a half years or so. But also what I'm doing right now within Vineyard Canada is uh, bringing leadership to an initiative called Vineyard Creative. And so, and that's been going on now for the last, I guess, three or four years as well, something like that. Uh, Just working with David and Anita and the rest of the national team, just really caring for and creating space for uh, for creatives and for artists within within the movement, um, well, particularly in Canada. Yeah, and then on top of that, I mean, I've been a worship leader and a worship pastor for a, <laughs> a good chunk of my life uh, yeah. at this point. So, uh, yeah, that, probably that, that just feels like old hat, doesn't it? it well, it, yeah, and it's the thing, and it, but it's also the thing that'll be in my dying breath. It's like, yeah, it's the thing. It's yeah. what you, you know, when you kept me, that's ultimately what I what I bleed. Um, mm, I that's think, good. So. That's good. Let me dive in here for just a moment on Vineyard Creative especially kind of in that Canadian world, because you guys, you have this initiative called Vineyard Creative, and it houses things like worship and songwriting and and some of that stuff that we're pretty familiar with, especially on the Vineyard worship side of things. But you guys do other things, or you're you're making space for other things as well, is aren't you? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, that's exactly right. So it is the, it is the housing. It kind of contains what, you know, what we understand with like, I would call liturgical work, work for the church that's there to, to, to resource and give language and worship language and, and songs and all of those things. But yeah, in the last number of years, we have really extended the invitation to everyone who makes it. Essentially, it's like everyone who makes stuff that didn't exist before you thought of it. Yeah. You know, so uh, not to preclude, I mean, it's about the fine arts for sure. But we we have people who are part of Vineyard Creative uh, meaningfully, and they're like, they're chefs. They prepare food. That's their creativity. And... Um, and so trying to broaden the conversation around that and around what the work of imagination getting materialized means. And so, which has been a blast actually, just kind of trying to reconstruct an idea or a community around that rather than just simply a common form, right? Which music is obviously our, you know, we've been doing that forever. As long as there's been a vineyard, we've been making music, which is an incredible legacy and a very much important part of what we're doing. That's it's it's kind of everyone on some yeah. level, you know. I mean, there's more to say about that, um, but yeah. Uh, well, a, a couple of weeks ago, I was on 
one of the calls with the vineyard creative folks from Canada. And of course it was Zoom. And of course, I don't know most of those people. And of course it was, you know, just a touch under two hours and we're having this interaction. But I came away really touched by the heart and the sensitivity that you all have cultivated in that community. I could feel it even even through the technology, even through Zoom, you know, all, even through all the things that sort of disembody us from feeling things sometimes. Yeah. I could feel the heart of it there. And I, I think what I would like to say to you and maybe even for those who are in that community who might be listening to this podcast, I, I just want to say I loved the spirit of that moment. Whatever that evening was that we shared together, the spirit was so good. And I came away feeling like, I don't know who those people are and I don't know what they're doing necessarily, but it doesn't feel like propaganda or marketing. Well, <laughs> so <laughs> I love hearing you say that. It's You know what I think it is, honestly? I, it, to me, it feels like generosity. Mm-hmm. It's an incredibly generous. When you So when you get a bunch of creatives, Christ-centered creatives, I think it's worth kind of throwing that into the conversation, yeah. who maybe don't have a shared discipline or, or craft or whatever, but they have a shared sense of vocation and purpose. And there's that mutual kind of celebration. It becomes such a generous environment because you just kind of become everybody's cheerleader, even if you don't fully understand or it's not your it's not your main thing. It's like, and that's what I love about it. I love you, you know you kind of can't go wrong when you get a bunch of artists and creatives in a room and just start talking about the stuff that makes them makes their heart beat faster. Like it just it and it and the thing I've seen over and over again, I would say, is generosity of spirit. Mm and generosity with time. And I, I mean, I just, I love it. I, 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 one of my favorite things in the world is to hang out with, with people like that. Well, I could feel it from the outside, you know, just Sweet. as an outsider coming in, putting my toes in that water, I could feel it. And, and I also just want to say shout out to Sheza. Was she the lady who was kind of like co-hosting that moment with you? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. My dear friend, my dear friend, Sheza Anslus, Sherry. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, from the Winnipeg Center Vineyard, really brilliant lady. Yeah, well, shout out to her because she sort of curated this moment before we did our conversation piece that I was sort of involved in. She yes. curated this moment where she was sharing a song and kind of a video that some maybe someone else had helped make that goes with the song really speaking to some current Canadian events that are fairly heavy. And, totally heavy, yeah. And I, heavy. I just thought it was such a poignant moment and so well done. And it touched me, even though, again, outsider perspective and whatnot. So I, I just wanted to say on this podcast, shout out to that community and shout out to Sheza. That was really, really spectacular. We, we probably need to have her on and have a you conversation. You probably too. do. That's right. <laughs> Well, hey, Chris, let's just go back to you, though, and let's do the thing we always do on this podcast, which is do a little bit of personal history. You weren't always a pastor. You weren't always a worship leader. You weren't always an adult. Uh, You were (laughs) once a child from a family, and we'd love to just know about that. How How was your upbringing? Yeah, well, I mean, I have an amazing family, amazing parents. I was not raised as a believer, Uh, We weren't a religious household or even a household of faith or whatever language you want to throw on that. You know, so we just kind of we just kind of grew up. We were a loving family. You know, there's four of us boys. Right. So it was my mom and five dudes, Um, you know, so a little bit of chaos erupting in that. But my folks and I actually we came to the Lord around the same time, but independently from one another, which is Mm. a really interesting story. Uh, Just all sort of driven by neighborhood relationships, me with my next door neighbor and one of my best friends at the time. And and they with a neighbor across, well, my mom with a neighbor, a neighbor across the road. And, and these were just relationships that were really natural. And some questions got asked. And so, you know, and I had some experiences. I pretty quickly got invited to a vineyard youth group, um, which in a very cool way was the place that I served as a pastor for about eight years later on in life, which was kind of amazing. And yeah, my dad followed along shortly after my mom. He was a, is a massive reader, and so my mom would just leave all these books out and stuff that she knew he couldn't help but read. And so the really cool thing is that within about four or five years, my dad was pastoring in the vineyard. So he, they had this wild kind of turnaround experience. 
and so at that point we we were a household of faith so we had this kind of you know you and your household kind of experience and you know that would have been around i think 1990 or so i was would, would you have been a teenager i was about 13 so just kind of right in that in between space right yeah. i mean for for me again i i mean i went to sunday school i don't know maybe three times in my entire childhood life there was no bible camp there was none of any of that stuff you know we had one practice that was christ centered around christmas time which was the practice of advent and so i knew that jesus symbolized the the light coming into the world i knew that story kind of our german roots you know in catholicism or whatever sort of starting to show up there and so it was part of my imagination i guess but then when i encountered people who actually believed that jesus was a somebody to be loved and someone who loved and uh, just behaved and structured their lives in a way that he was relevant. I'd never seen anything like that. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't a well-storied person at 13, but you know, whatever, right? It was yeah. really new to me, and uh, and I was just taken with it. So, and, uh, so Chris, if yeah. I could be a little granular here, yeah, what was the hook? Was it just friendship, like your buddies across the street? Was so, it was it just like you got drugged to the youth group and there were pretty girls there? Was it like the story of Jesus? Was it was honestly, it like spiritual? So like like something in the spirit? What? It was it was how real it was to the people. And what do you mean like okay, their like, experience of it. Their experience was so was so real and so legitimate and I could see that. And there was something that was like the passion as well, right? So, I mean, my very first youth group experience, I remember showing up and, and the pastor at the time, a guy named Len Weens, you know, he was just very passionate. And he, I, I forget exactly what he, was, what he was talking about, but he started talking about the influence of, you know, Satan or the devil or, or whatever in, in, it was kind of in the middle of the culture wars at that time a little bit. And so, yeah. you know, but he got so worked up and he, he's like, He's like, it's all BS, right? It's just, it's all BS. But he didn't say BS. He yeah. said the thing that I would say if we didn't have the tape recorder going, right? That's right. And my ear, like, I just couldn't believe that I was hearing that from a leader and that it just was so genuine in that moment. And I was compelled by that because it felt really, really unique. And then the Spirit of God became a big part of this, obviously, too, right? Just encounter. And uh, I mean, the place where it really sunk, so kind of moving along. So I, you know, my family we became believers, whatever. Once my parents were really into it, I kind of checked out for a little bit because it wasn't, it wasn't my thing anymore. Like I just kind of was like, oh, they're doing it. So yeah. I had a, about a year and a half where I, where I kind of, you know, did the whole backsliding thing. I mean, it was super pedestrian and not very interesting, but I, 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 <laughs> I, I wasn't know, even I good backsliding. <laughs> no, it wasn't even that interesting. But I, t I took a bit of a, a walk around the block, right? Yeah. And my folks started hosting after a time, they started hosting a youth group that meeting, like a, a small group for youth at our home. And it's like, ah, crap, I have to, I guess I have to go to this thing, which was their whole point. And so if I'm going to, I picked up the guitar by that point. And, you know, if I got to waste my time going to this stupid meeting, I, so I was, that I, it was my attitude at that point. Yeah. I, I drifted far enough. You know, if I, I may as well make this worth my while and work on my chops a little bit. So I started leading worship, which is a great attitude, by the way. For That's right. Leaders. It's <laughs> just exactly what God is wanting. Yeah. If you got to blow your time out, you may as well pick up a guitar and be useful. Yeah. But I remember in the middle of singing a song, uh, and I think it was, it was one of the Kevin Prosh's. I think it was like, or maybe this cracked me so good to me. I don't know. It was, mm. and it was one of those songs. This was a few weeks in, I found myself singing this song and right in the middle of it, it's just the words stuck in my throat because I realized that I meant them. And it, it, so, you know, and, and I never looked back. Like that moment was, was the true moment of, hey, this something transformative happened. And so, you know, I'm always a little bit, when people have these super stringent things around who can lead worship and who can't, it's like, well, I'm kind of in the club because someone someone gave me some space to exist in my uncomfortable imperfect way and i found in a really important way jesus in that place very personally isn't that amazing just from doing something maybe even out of selfish ambition i don't want to put words in your own mouth but that's maybe the way i heard that story a little bit like i may as well get better at my instrument you know if i'm gonna you know and god will meet us even there beautiful yeah, and he and he really did and it was and i mean i remember it and i remember it very it was it was impactful so well yeah. 
then that kicks off a journey of you being a worship leader. And I'm assuming you're doing this along with your parents. They're like continuing the pastor and whatnot. Well, they didn't become pastors until a little bit until a little bit later from from that point. So, but yeah, I mean, at that point, as a family, we are we're pressing in. You know, Jesus became really was was the central characteristic of my sort of the second half of my teenage life, mm. and so that just developed. And I and I knew. I mean, so in the background of all of this, the Toronto thing is happening as well, right? Yeah. And just our relationship at the Cambridge Vineyard, which is where I was was connected with at the time, and the airport vineyard at that time, they were really, really closely knit together relationally. And so we showed up there. We got the invite like on day day two of the extended conference that kind of went on for a decade or whatever yeah. it was. And so we showed up at this old, you know, this their original tiny space, you know, with our pastor and my parents were there and I was there. And like, you know, the beautiful complicated chaos of all of that just became such a big part of what my experience of Jesus was in that time too, right? So like the whole, <laughs> the wackadoodle kind of Holy Spirit, I mean, that was that was a, a daily diet for yeah. a long time, you know, and then going with Dan Wilt, who was leading worship at that time as well at the Cambridge Vineyard. And so we were going down every week and leading worship. We did that for months and hosting nightly gatherings in our own church. And, you know, so that was part of the soup of all of this as well, which I consequently got quite disillusioned with for a good chunk of time. And and recently the Lord tapped me on the shoulder and said, you have to get over for yourself. I was in that at least, at least somewhat. That's right. Well, you know, it's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting to me because before we pressed record, I was just asking you about your church. How was yesterday? You know, that kind of thing. And y you were mentioning even that that you guys were maybe on Sunday slowly walking through like the Ignatian examine kind of a, an idea, yeah. right? And I, I just think that's very interesting only because so many people who I know who have had really profound charismatic experiences especially those connected to Toronto in particular, mm -hmm. I I've noticed that as they age, it's not that they reject any of those experiences because they seem to be formative and in some ways an anchor to just their relationship with God, but they seem to mature into this other side of Christian practice that might be considered contemplative. Well, totally. I mean, I think what you realize, or I'll just speak for myself. Sure. You know, I mean, there is such an extraordinary amount of power that gets transacted in that kind of dynamic. And some of it is the Lord and some of it definitely isn't, right? There's just so much energy that's, you know, and and, and so you want to, so much genuine experience. But having something that feels like an ancient kind of container, not to be able to further control things, but just to have some kind of depth and grounding in the midst of these experiences feels really, really healthy. And I mean, and David uh, Roos has talked about this, you know, kind of like having, you know, like a like an electrical grid. It needs to have capacity. Otherwise, a big charge comes along and the entire grid gets blown out, right? And so whatever we can do through regular practices to create some capacity so that when there's a surge, it's like, yeah, you might kind of feel that matrixy sort of thing happen. But I was I sound like a wild charismatic here. No, um, not exactly I, I think this vibe, is vibe, but I think it's a good metaphor. I like but it. But there's yeah, but there's something in I think and we learn that hard in Canada. Hard. Like the spin out for a lot of the vineyard churches and spin out might not I mean that might be a little bit bleak, but it it led into a really kind of wildernessy season of trying to figure out how all this stuff worked because there was amazing fruit and my life is part of the fruit of that but there was also a lot of carnage right yeah. and so there was this sense of like okay how do we develop healthy practices and that one in particular has been a tremendously healthy practice and realizing that we're not the lord didn't start doing this 20 years ago right yeah you know, well and the other the thing i see in maybe the contemplative side of Christian practice is, I see it, to use David's word here, building capacity for just waking people up to the fact that God is 
at work and in our lives, even when it's not spectacular, that it doesn't have to be spectacular. It, it yeah. could be, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah. Well, and, and the thing is, is that, you know, it's when the flow of good things is happening, uh, it's all pretty easy. Right. It's in the other it's in the other seasons that you find out what it what it looks like to actually dig deep and, and to I mean, the. You know, the borough, was it Eugene Peterson's, right? Like, I'm going to butcher the reference. You know it. Uh, long faithfulness in the same direction. Or sure, like yeah. That. You know, I mean, that stuff gets written in the dry seasons, right? And that's, and in Canada, it's been a dry season, at least in a lot of our communities for a time, right? For more than a minute. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, totally cultivating those those sorts of practices is just really, really helpful for the long journey. And I think that that's... You know, everyone, anyone can look awesome in a minute, but, you know, if you're talking about lifetime kind of conversations, you Amen. need practices, right? You're, you're preaching my message, Chris. This is it. <laughs> like, I mean, is it, but this is a great frame to put on. I mean, I'm 43. I'm in decent health and there's no guarantees, right? Like maybe I'll drop dead tomorrow, but probably I won't. And if things go as I think they may go, I mean, gosh. I'm, I'm going to live probably for another four decades, maybe longer. Yeah. You know, I mean, and that's, that's the case for a lot of people. And you have to go, well, what sort of experiences might a person experience if they're going to walk with Jesus for 80 years? Yeah. Yeah, so go ahead. Just to kind of press into that as a metaphor. And I, you know, we all, we all have genetics, right? And if we pay attention to, to what the the strengths and the weaknesses are of the generations that have kind of gone before us. Like I'm looking at my folks and, and they're dealing with certain health conditions, certain health things. My dad had a heart attack a little while ago, about a year and a half ago now, you know? And so I look at that stuff and I know, I look at those things and I go, okay, what can I do now that will help to shore up? Because I have a propensity. That's right. We share genes, right? Yeah. And it's not different in the church. We can look and we can look back and, and, and figure out what kind of practices are really healthy and, and where some of our pitfalls are. And the vineyard has pitfalls, man. I mean, we've seen that. The, the charismatic movement has, has pitfalls. And so it's okay to acknowledge those and go, hey, we're going to build some practices in so that we are doing okay and we're healthy, right? I think we're trying to be. Let me switch gears here and maybe dig into a bit of your Canadian history, especially as it relates to worship. Uh, a few weeks ago, you and I shared a moment along with Casey and Melissa and Mike on Clubhouse, and Casey was just sort of referencing the rich heritage of worship that exists in Canada. And I think a lot of people in the vineyard have this in their in their worldview, but maybe they don't, and especially yo younger worship leaders maybe don't. Yeah, sure. There's just such a well of songs and creativity and really like worship values that that didn't just come from Anaheim, but really came came from Canada. You know, and I'm thinking of people like Brian Dirksen and Craig Musso and 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 it, Al, even now like Andy Park and Daphne Rademacher, like songs that that I know growing up and. And of course, David Roos, I mean, you know, there's just yeah. such a cast of characters and men and women who really helped shape worship 
for, in many ways, the world. I, I would just love for you to talk a little bit about the Canadian contribution to worship, especially for us vineyard folk. Because a lot of people who listen to this are not from Canada. Yeah. So I, I have a couple of perspectives. One is the perspective of just being a, a young person in the middle of all of that stuff that was happening and yeah. how that influenced m me as a worship leader, as a Jesus follower. You know, and then there's kind of the perspective of that I've, you know, had the privilege of gaining over the last few years by being able to hang out with some of the people that you're talking about and getting some of their perspective on that. And so I think the first thing is, you know, that that I, I, I and I think this is still true, broadly speaking, across the movement, but I just really appreciate it as a distinctive is that, you know, so for as a young person in the middle of that, we we have these songs that we're singing and there is personality that's starting to emerge, right? Everybody in the vineyard and eventually, you know, in, in massive swaths of the church around the world starts to know the name, you know, Brian Dirksen, David Roos, and these guys that you're mentioning, right? There's this thing. And yet there's this sense of accessibility and not superstarness that's that's part of the culture of that day as I, as I remember it. There's no reason, you know, because those guys all came through, you know, we had a, a smallish church and those guys all would come through and, and, and with teaching and spending time and stuff. And it's like, there was just no reason to suppose that that was for somebody else to do. There was absolute invitation in that. Of course, of course, I'm going to write songs. Of course, that's what that's what you do when you're in when you're in the vineyard is you start to articulate language, worship language and gift that forward to your community. It just felt really natural and normal. And so I think that part of the dynamic of that is that it was such an accidental thing, at least from everybody's perspective, the people who were involved, mm. right? There was no industry that was driving this thing. There were no sales targets there. I mean, it didn't even exist as an industry, not, not really. Something happened in this little backwater-ish country within the Western world, I guess. You have these guys who are writing songs and they're not writing them for any other purpose, guys and gals. But at that point, you know, there it was largely, the, you know, these men who are writing. Obviously, we've made some shifts in, in what, what voices we're listening to, which is beautiful in, in since. But, you know, they're just writing songs out of their experience and out of their love for Christ. Right. And then there's this traction that comes and the songs start to grow. And of course, you've you've done a lot of a lot of good work in terms of being able to to narrate that story through this podcast with different different people, but the humility and the unexpected nature of what was taking place was such an important part of what formed the culture of vineyard worship, certainly in Canada. Mm. You know, because there wasn't there wasn't an intent to do anything except to respond to what God was doing in the moment, mm. right? And so what I think is really remarkable as I look at some of these individuals is just, again, we talk about the longevity, a long faithfulness in the same direction. You know, you spend time with these guys and they're really just trying to love and follow Jesus. They're, they're not trying to prop up careers. They're not, you know, most, you know, and I'm not going to put words in anyone's mouth, but I know a number of them have sat across some really lucrative deals and pushed the paperback unsigned because it just wasn't the invitation that Jesus was putting to, to them, right? And mm. so all of that starts to bleed over into the, into the culture and into the assumptions, which is why, you know, when the fleeting, you know, moment of favor, it did kind of drift from the Canadian vineyard, right? I, there was a time where you released a song and, and you had resources that would flow back as a result and you could keep doing the work. And eventually that narrative shifted, right? So there's not a lot of us that are releasing music and getting a return monetarily on that. And yet the work is still being done. And I, and I think that that in a lot of ways has to do with just the integrity of what God was doing in that early, in the early days with those, with those individuals. Mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense. Uh, it does make sense. And I love that you tell the story that way. And you sort of like draw it out that long, because a moment ago, you were talking about how, at least in the Canadian context, and it would also be the same here in the U.S. as well, when Vineyard Worship first began to get some traction, just, you know, in our own movement and then beyond our movement, there really wasn't a worship industry, you know, and I'm using air quotes here. Yeah, yeah. But, but now there is, and so you could pursue that, 
you know, again, air quotes, pursue that if you wanted. But I just love that you're telling this story in a way that shows that there are people who are being faithful to that first invitation. You know, with humility, it's really not pursuing the industry. Not that that would be off limits to everyone at all times, but that in general, you know, as worship leaders in the vineyard, most of us are probably not going to have a career like that. And not only is that okay, but maybe that's the invitation we carry. Yeah. And I mean, to speak to some of that too, the, some of that was not entirely always helpful for the artistry either of, you know, there were certain things that kind of got almost, you know, almost became mandated in terms of this is the kind of culture that our songwriters in, embody, right? We don't do this. We don't do that. We don't pursue these things. And I don't, yeah. I don't want to sort of come across and say, well, it's only, it's only this way. But I think in terms of heart posture and the thing that ultimately wakes us up in the morning, and compels compels the, the you know again I'm going to use air, air quotes here the work yeah that we're compelled to do you know being compelled by by the by the humble invitation of God is is a much more sustainable thing creative success and and all of that I I, I love that stuff I love it when I when when people start to flourish and when there are resources that start to, to get exchanged yeah. I mean that's a good thing or you know. Or can be. Let's say it can be a good thing, but it doesn't equate to being around for a long time faithfully. Yeah, and it, it, it also just doesn't even equate to uh, the blessing of God. It could be, <laughs> absolutely, but it, but it might not be. You know, so mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I, lo I love the nuance that you're interjecting here. I'd also be interested in this because you did grow up in that atmosphere. You did grow up with these mentors. Dan Wilt, who we love, shout out to Dan. I'm wondering what resonances did you pick up? Because you've mentioned things like humility. You've you've mentioned things like a long obedience in the same direction. Just keep doing the work, you know? You've mentioned those. Is there anything else that you sort of picked up from these early vineyard worship pioneers that seems relevant for us today? I think honestly, it's that a fruitful life really matters in in the life in the working life of a creative whether you're a worship leader or whatever like honestly a, a fruitful life that's that's not all about whether we win or or lose in our particular our creative work can become all-encompassing right it is such a focal point and that's great i think it should be uh important work has that effect on us right but it's not the main thing and i think that that's what i i mean i'm so grateful for that lesson uh, just kind of almost by osmosis, although I think there's some there was some intentionality in that. But is my creative flourishing? You know, and I don't want to get mutually exclusive here, but is my creative flourishing more important than my marriage? Mm. Absolutely not. Is my pastoral ministry more important than being a good friend? Ab absolutely not. Like there are things that are more important. And I think that that really has come across in some of these relationships. I'm just so so grateful and privileged to to have had, right? Like, yeah. you know, with Dan and David and stuff, and it's like looking for fruit and trying to recognize fruit in my own life has been really, really important. Yeah, um, and there was a lot of years of that kind of, you know, being where I where I. <laughs> I wanted to be awesome in my in my craft, but I just didn't feel like I was winning. I just didn't feel like I was making headway. I wasn't having impact or whatever. And there came a day where it was like it was enough to just kind of be a person that I, to know that the work of God was being done in the kind of person that I was, mm -hmm. that being enough. I'm really grateful that I was given eyes from some of these mentors to be able to recognize that if that makes sense. It does. And when you say a fruitful life, I mean, you, you sort of defined it there a little bit, but part of what I hear you say is it feels holistic. It's just not narrowly measured in like your career as a artist or a musician, but it's it has to also be measured by our marriages, our friendships, our children, the people we work with, do we show up in our community? 
Well, the sense of our trajectory, like where we place ourselves or understand ourselves to be in relation to God's will, right? I spent a lot of time as a youth, and and, and this was, again, one of the more unhelpful things that maybe got inherited in, in the tradition that I was steeped in, right? Like the sense like you have to make the right decisions and, and find yourself in the right place so that you can be in God's will, right? So God's will is locational. God's will is vocational. God's will is you know, taking the right risk in the right time. And, and it is those things some of the time, but it's way more what kind of person you are in the midst of what your circumstances are, right? Like what kind of a person are you when you think you're in the middle of God's will, but you find yourself suddenly, you know, and this is part of our story. We did a big, you know, Liv and I did a big leap of faith, you know, I don't know, 11 years, 10 years, no, a lot longer than that. Anyway, a long time ago. We moved to Winnipeg, and we thought we were going to encounter glory in this big risk, and we encountered a year of abject poverty, and it was like, oh, this sucks. This does not feel like God's will. But there was something that was being done. Mm. Who who were we in that space? Mm. You know, feel, it just has become a really important question. Mm. Yeah, I, I like that you're framing it that way as well, because sometimes in certain church cultures, God's will just leads to to FOMO, right? Just this overwhelming fear of missing out. As, as is, though, you know, it could just pass you by and then your life is is ruined. Yeah. Yeah. There's a tremendous amount of anxiety that comes from having to just shore yourself up under those kinds of weights. Yeah. And I think it's a real it's a real thing for the creative type and for the creative person, the person who identifies vocationally, like they have, by that I mean vocational, I mean has a calling, has feels a calling as a creative, because that's sort of a way that I would sort of delineate. Everyone's everyone's creative, but some Correct. people feel vocationally or they're called to this work. And I think we can lose a lot of energy ar around that, trying to suss out the steps and be in the right place at the right time and all that stuff. And it's like, okay, but who are we? That's where all the work gets done anyway. Mm, love that. I, I love that you're mentioning just the creative work. And one of the things that I put over here in my notes has to do with you as a creative. And it has to do with the fact that I know that you and your, your wife live, that you make music and you do stuff, you know, in the church. Gosh, you've written so many songs for the church. But recently, you two have been doing some things that we might call it's a creative project, maybe for outside of the church. And I'd love for you just to talk about that a little bit, especially because you're a pastor. So it's it's not as though you've just, you know, walked out of the church and was like, well, that was for a season, you know? So talk to me about that dichotomy of writing music, having a band. Yeah. And then also, yeah. well, on Sunday morning, I'm going to show up and give a message and maybe share communion with the community. So just talk to me about that. Yeah. Still trying to figure that out a little bit, um, yeah. but I guess it was about four or five years ago, and there was there was a process that we went through. But it just all of a sudden felt like the most right thing for Liv and I to actually throw our creative energy into one pot together, and this to become the thing you know the thing that we do. We don't have kids; it's just not part of the way our story worked out, and so. You know, and we had this really interesting moment where with some friends of ours in the backyard and, you know, it involved some some wine or some scotch or something like that. And, you know, we were just dreaming together and there was this thing, this shared, this shared thing of making music and doing the writing. And during this conversation, it just, you know, you have these moments, they just kind of, uh, they just feel pregnant mm. with possibility and purpose. Mm. And, uh, and so we committed together with, with these friends that we were going to say yes to every kind of thing that would create new possibility creatively. We were just going to say yes to it in the community, wherever, right? And we really interestingly followed through. And that's part of the benefit of doing this with your life partner, right? It's yeah. like you, you can't fake a yes like that, right? Yeah. Like you're in. And yeah. so... And so in that year, you know, we got up on like over a hundred stages and most of them were open mics. We landed a few gigs and there was just something that was so like, you talk about fruitfulness. There was something that was so life-giving and beautiful in those moments. I mean, we would get up and I, I would like to think that we do, we do good work together, right? I think that that's, that's part of it. 
But, you know, we would get up on these open mic stages and some of the interactions that we would have with people afterwards were just so extraordinarily life affirming. Right. Yeah. And it just, you know, it just was really, really beautiful. And so we continued to pursue that and, and, and write. And there was sort of this, like, anyone who knows us at all um, knows that we are not a Shangri-La kind of couple, right? Like, it's love and war, baby. You know, we are, we're yeah. absolutely one another's advocates. We also, you know, we've, we've also got, like, our knives hidden, right? Like, we're mm -hmm. ready to defend or to, mm -hmm. to defend our, ter our turf, mm -hmm. you know? And so learning how to co-create and learning how to get out of one another's way and, you know, how to write a song and then hand it to your spouse and say, here, break it and fix it, you yeah. know? And so, so that's been a blast. And we've actually, yeah, we like cut a record with the yeah. anchor guys and had a really great time doing that. And then you, you just did another single as well, right? And we did another single with, uh, with Carl and uh, called I Wonder. And we had a lot of, a lot of fun with that one. It feels good to me. I like I like the record you did with them as well, but the single feels like everything's settled. Mm. You know, it feels more feels more natural. Even That's great. even like your delivery just feels so much more. I don't know. I think natural is the right word, and it's for me. It's really potent. I I, I clicked on the link when you posted it, and I was like, "You guys have leveled up." Oh, thanks, man. Like, yeah, it's beautiful. Well, there's something about finding voice and cultivating a voice, right? Yeah, that's right. I think, you know, and, and again, like when you have strong personalities, and I've been doing music for a long, long time, and I also have, uh, I have a healthy ego, right? Sure. And so creating space for like, for Liv to come and to really put her fingerprints and to, and to take this, these sonics in different directions. And it turns out she's a brilliant producer. You know, I often say she's not always right. But she's like never wrong, which can be very frustrating from time to time. Mm, mm, <laughs> you know. Mm. Well, um, well, talk to talk to me about that too, because that's that's interesting to make things with your wife. You know, and you do know each other, and yet you do both have an ego. You both have ideas. You're both musicians. You're both good. You both can sing. Uh, so there's some competency there that's informing the opinions even. So just talk to me about working it out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, man. It's sometimes <laughs> it's like, sometimes it feels, okay, sometimes the magic happens and it's simple. Yeah. Right. And, and sometimes it's like, you know, it's back and forth and, you know, it's like, I, I can't, you know, <laughs> like my favorite, this is my favorite moment in co-creating. Okay, yeah. to live. I tend to be the lyricist. She's written some killer songs recently. In fact, the next single is, is going to be all her song. But, mm. you know, coming to her, I, I will tend to write the lyrics. And so I came to her with a, with a song idea, with a pitch and a lyric. And she listened to it. And she said, she said, don't make me sing that. Don't right? make me sing that. Don't make like me like sing the that. whole song or a particular line? No, no, no. The whole song. It was like this. <laughs> this. <laughs> don't make me sing that. This is not a McQueen song, right? Yeah. And so, and, I mean, and that's, but honestly, that's where the magic is, right? Mm. So, you know, you talk about, like, we want to, we want to think about synergy, right? We come along and, and, you know, all the juices are flowing and it's, it's simple and it's easy. And I've had a couple of moments like that, that were just like, wow, that was beautiful and easy. And then there's other art that looks like, you know, you talk about the beauty of the cross, right? The cruciform beauty of Christ, yeah. you know, kind of going through conflict, going through suffering. Yeah. And sometimes it looks like for real, sometimes it looks like that, yeah. like dying to something. Yeah. I have this idea that I really, really like and I'm attached to. And I I'm going to let it go. But the end result is that we continually put up music. If no one else likes it, we like our own music. We listen to our own music. Well, but wouldn't, right? that be the, wouldn't that be the ultimate sin, though, to make music that you didn't like or you didn't believe in oh, so that's yeah. that's the first thing right that's the first hurdle do i do i love it yep yeah absolutely well so and and now we're having so much fun actually having a band like so it was the two of us for a long time yeah but now we have we have a band we've got you know involving like our next door neighbor um mm -hmm. involving another friend he's become a dear friend he and his wife but the connection is through the music community it's not through the church at all so we have these this kind of community that's forming around what, what we're doing and it's taking on some new shape in that 
And I mean, as a pastor, as you talk about that, I love that my world is not just surrounded by Christians or with people that I'm ministering to or trying yeah. to, because uh, I really miss that from the old world. I love being a pastor most of the time, but I do miss being surrounded by people like just in the workforce, right? That's right. Like, well, my, yeah. my brother-in-law and I, well, my brother-in-law mostly, he calls that reality brackish waters, right? It's there where these go. two very different things come together. And you can see it. It's like, wow, what, it, what are these two worlds that are colliding? Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. Chris, do you, think, do you think you guys will get to play music in front of people by the fall? Oh, I think so. Yeah. Think talk, so. talk to me about that. Like, things have been a little locked down. Oh, man. <laughs> yes, they have. Yeah. I mean, it's, the story has changed a lot in the last two or three weeks. Uh, okay. For Canada, but we have been in some form of lockdown, like significant lockdown since Easter. So, I mean, we're talking months at this point, longer than in any of the other ones that we had. And, wow. and uh, you know, numbers going in all the wrong directions and, and all that stuff. And so we're, we're just now starting to see Unfortunately, where I live right now is like the, if you guys know the the, the Delta variant, right? That's, yes, yes. You know, we're like the hot spot in Canada, right? Like mm. right in my county. But but things are starting to turn around. So we're starting to reopen a little bit. You know, I just got my double tap the other day, right? So, you know, we're starting to move things in the in the right direction. And we can, we did our first live in-person band practice with the McQueen's band uh, a few days ago. Oh my gosh, that felt so good. Yeah, It felt so good to not be trying to like, cause we jam out a little bit. And how do you jam with a, even to touch a latency? It's like, our drummer is a saint. You know, he just, he just suffers for the sake of everyone else or yeah. he's playing ahead of the beat constantly. Yeah, But we were actually able to make music together. And mm. so, I think we are. I think we're going to see something by late summer, early fall, where we'll actually be able to make music in front of people and maybe even, you know, get into some. We had this, our best show ever was like literally six days before everything shut down. So pick it um, back up. Yeah, exactly. Boom. And so that's the thing, you know, it was like. So, I'm, okay. So I'm just interested when, when you guys practice, do you have like a garage? Are you guys a garage band? Well, right now we're a backyard band. Okay. Who's um, backyard? Because we're still ours, ours. Okay, we still cool. Because we're still outside. We can't be inside with one another. Yeah. That's just kind of off off the table right now. But uh, we have we have a loft. So where I am right now, actually, we've got a, like a studio loft, and yeah. so we jam into this tiny little room. Actually, there's a, there's something on YouTube. It's a little band practice that we did last year, and uh, just jamming on one of our tunes. And yeah, it's right there. It's tight. It's That's tight. good. That's good. Well, Chris, I was wondering also, just on the music thing. Maybe you could do this favor for me because I would like to see a McQueen show. And I also have this Canadian musician who's maybe like top five favorite musician of all time for me. Like, could you guys play a show with Kathleen Edwards? Could you do that for me? I would love to. I will, I will be there. I will help you guys unload stuff. Call <laughs> Kathleen. I think she has a coffee shop. Let's go. All right. All right. Actually, you know what? I... Truth, truth be told, and this, I, I might have my my lines crossed in this one, but I don't think so. I think we have a mutual friend. Get out of here! Get out have, of my face! I think we have a mutual friend. So. Okay, Chris, I'm telling you, <laughs> like I will come through the border. There you go. I, I've, I'm fully vaccinated. Let's go. I will. I will haul gear. I just this is this would be the dream. So let's go. Sweet man, I'm, I'm, I'll work on it. That's I'll right. Work on that. Yeah. That is right. Well, listen, Chris, thanks for an hour. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on here. You know, I'm a yeah. fan of this, uh, this show of yours. So no, I'm, I'm I, I love, I love what you guys it. do, and I love having you on, and I just love the model that you're putting out into the world. Hmm. Pastor, worship leader, side projects, ancient future, spirit grounded. You're a both and guy. Hmm. Well, thanks, dude. Appreciate that. All right, everybody, listen. When you go out into the world today, maybe what you ought to do is pull up your Spotify or your Apple Music, type in the McQueens, you'll be able to find it. It's there. McQueens with an A, M-A-C. M-A-C, that's right, not M-C. M-A-C, that's correct. All right, everybody, peace.
Hey everyone, Casey Corum here, producer of the podcast. Thanks for listening. As always, if you've been enjoying the podcast, here's a few ways you can help us. First of all, leave us a review on the podcast platform of your choice. This helps more people find us. Also connect with us on social media, Instagram at the Ferment Podcast and Twitter at Fermentcast. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. See you next week. Peace.